Hey, everybody. Pete A. Turner from the Break It Down Show. I wanted to introduce to you today's guest, Chris Van Etten, who is an actor and a model. Now, get this. And I'm going to say this again. Chris Van Etten is an actor who plays Chet Driscoll on the longtime daytime drama General Hospital. Not to be confused with co-head writer from General Hospital, who goes by the name Chris Van Etten. Uh, yeah, there's two of these guys today, and I want to get the co-writer today. We've got the veteran Marine badass who's also a jockey underwear model. So Chris Van Etten, who plays Chet Driscoll on General Hospital and is also a jockey model, is our guest today. And I wanted you guys to understand just how incredible he is as we feature all of these veterans who've taken significant damage on the battlefield. Chris is one of these guys. He's a double amputee. The bomb that took his legs also took his best friend TJ's life. So through that, you get survivor's guilt, a TBI, PTSD, and obviously you lose portions of two of your legs. That does not stop Chris. I used his image of him on the leg press machine because this guy is just relentless and will not quit. And I'm proud to have him on the team. I'm proud to have him on the show. I'm proud that he's a Marine who defended our freedom, and I love that Scott and I got to hang out with him, and I want a special shout out to Josue Barone, who was also there when we recorded at Husing Ranch. You guys are really going to love Chris's attitude and his approach to life. A couple of quick things, just if you can, subscribe, rate, review. That's a great way to help us. Maybe take these special stories about these special people and share them on your feed. That really, really helps us. Okay. And then for everybody else, Save the Brave. Here's what I want you to do. Go to savethebrave.org, click on donate, go to the monthly subscription part and enter a small amount of money. Just something that's going to help these guys out day to day. Here's my question. Would you buy a veteran lunch once a month? That's what we're talking about. Lunch. Just put some money in and we'll do the rest. All right. Let's get back to it. Chris Van Etten with Scott Husing and I on the Break It Down Show. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this Heath. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Chris Van Etten. You're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, so we're here at El Rancho Husingo for the uh, Spanish speakers in the audience. But another great episode with a couple fellow vets. And we got an in-studio guest, my good friend Josue Barone, 3-5, Dark Horse, uh, sitting in on this one. And then we're going to team up next. But Chris and I were introduced, Pete through a good friend of ours, Lisa Strickland, mm-hmm. and a couple others. And for the listeners out there who aren't familiar with Chris, he is a Marine, of course, uh, like many people I know, but has really ventured out after his transition to the Marine Corps, serving his, serving his country, uh, being a combat-wounded vet, warrior, into the entertainment space, like like a lot of us that, that we have on the show as, a, as an actor. He's done some writing. He's a hunky jockey underwear model. Come on, yeah, you know that's true. Yeah, so, yeah, whatever. Yeah, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, man. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, tell the listeners, uh, everybody, tune in, uh, kind of how you were propelled into the Marine Corps in and bring us up to speed on where you're at now. Yeah. So what originally got me to join the Marine Corps was actually kind of, uh, I guess, the stereotypical rebellion from my parents, more specifically my dad. I knew he had a a little bit of a hatred for Marines at the time. (laughs) So I thought, what better way to get back at him than to join the Marine Corps? turns out he was completely fine with it and he was actually really proud. But that's kind of what got me started that along with just all the stories you hear about the camaraderie and, you know, the brotherhood in the Marine Corps. And yeah, so I joined right out after high school. I did one deployment on the 31st Mew, and then on my deployment, my next deployment to Afghanistan is when I got injured. Ended up losing both of my legs, one above, one below, along with the classic like TBIs and, and stuff like that. And 
Uh, yeah. So then I got out after about a year of therapy and that's when I started getting into the showbiz side of things. So what years were that? When did you enlist in the second deployment? When did you get injured and how? Yeah. So I enlisted in 2009 and then when I got injured was 2012. So yeah, I did about a year and I got out basically year to the day of my, uh, end date for my four-year contract anyways. So many people have so many different reasons for joining the Marine Corps and yours was to spite your dad. Was he like the Air Force or something? Yeah, or? both my parents All right, were. there you go. Yeah. yeah. So there, you know, sibling rivalry or whatever. Everybody's got a unique reason to join and you guys are, you and Josue here are both, you know, 30-somethings and the reasons you join a lot of, a lot of times we ask, was it because of 9-11? Was it the sense of patriotic duty? And what was your definition of, of patriotism that really thrust you in? Was there any of that going on? Or? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, living with two parents in the military, I was comfortable with that lifestyle. I mean, by the time I was 14, I had moved nearly 10 times just in oh, wow. the first 14 years of my life. So I was very used to like that whole world. And then obviously that comes with a sense of duty. It's like whether, and I knew going in, whether it was going to be four years or 20 years or however many years, I knew I had to to serve, at least give back to this country in some way or form. And yeah, so there was a lot of that, I would say. I, I do joke around with the, the spite thing uh, with my dad because he's one of my best friends now, but at the time we didn't get along so well. But yeah, no, it's just, it's a combination of things like I think it is for most people. Yeah. I mean, when you're a teenager at odds with your folks, most, most yeah. kids are. And, and I was the same way, you know, I think a lot of us joined the military because we're kind of seeking some structure that we don't have growing up and, you know, we need that discipline. It, it, I think it's in us and it's in us in a certain way as, as protectors, as people that make up such a small percentage of the American population. And when you're a young kid, you, I mean, you joined where you're 18, 19 years old. Yeah. 18. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, did, and at the height of the war, I, I mean, a lot of the veterans serving today, they've gone on to do such great things. And it's their whole career. They've known nothing but a career at war. And when you joined, were you, were you thinking about that? Were you thinking about all the risk that was involved with what you were doing, especially because you, what was your job in the Marine Corps? I was infantry. Oh, yeah, 311. Infantry. Yeah. I mean, I think we all knew the risks. You know, we all, especially if you join any time after 9-11, you knew pretty much if you joined the infantry or some sort of combat arms position that there's a pretty strong chance that you were going to get some sent somewhere that could uh, possibly kill you. And But I think like a lot of people, it's kind of one of those things where it's, I wouldn't say a second thought, but just, you know, it's... If it happens, it happens. How do you get to that point, though? I mean, all of us have gotten to that point, but how do you get there? I don't know. I try to think of that, and I try to figure it out myself, but it was just never really anything that bothered me. Even when we were flying to Afghanistan, and you know, okay, like we're about to really be in it, and seeing you know that first real war experience, you know, that what I call it, it's like the, the moment that everyone has when you're in a combat zone and you you almost feel like you you lose your innocence like that first big thing that happens but none of that really bothered me because i f i was always one of those people like when it's my time it's my time and if it's my time is in afghanistan it's there if my time is getting run over by a bus in illinois where i was from then so be it but i'd rather be doing something cool than get run over by some metro bus <laughs> Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. But none of that really bothered me because I feel... I was always one of those people like when it's my time, it's my time. And if it's my time is in Afghanistan, it's there. If my time is getting run over by a bus in Illinois where I was from, then so be it. But I'd rather be doing something cool than get run over by some Metro bus. <laughs> well, yeah, I think a lot of the young guys when they join, I've, I've written about this in, in certain ways is before you're thrust into that, the dynamics of being on the battlefield and being in combat, 
you, you do have all these ridiculously unrealistic images of what war is going to be like, what combat is going to be like. It's, you know, you're going to jump off the, the trucks or, or, you know, hop off the helicopters and, you know, blaze into battle and you're just going to like annihilate this inferior enemy. And then when you're jammed into that situation, those peaks that are so short balanced by those long periods of boredom, it's totally different. And I think a lot of the young Marines that I was surrounded by and that I led that romance wore off quickly once the first rounds started striking. And once the first guys started getting wounded or killed, that's a stark reality for a lot of people that, and it, it takes a long time, I think for me and, and for most to, to really be able to process all that and look back and, and kind of balance it. And what's funny is, you know, we run into so many people in this, in, in what we do on this show, on the, on the break it down show is people will say this. Yeah. My dad never talked about that. My, my brother never talked about that. My husband, what makes it easier for you to talk about these things and, and, and like just put your whole story out there? Because what is not talking about it ever done to help the situation? If someone's struggling, we've been, and we've talked about this in length, I know before is you hold it in, you know, it bothers you. And that is the reason why this epidemic with veterans committing suicide and feeling like there's no one there. It's not, because no one is there it's because they can't feel like they can open up and talk about what's bothering them and then it just gets to a point where it's too late to to save them yeah uh, mentally in their head they think that it's the the best way is to end it and i wanted to help try to break that in some way and i'm i mean i don't i'm by no means like i don't go around toting like i'm some sort of war hero there are plenty of people who have seen more done more um than i have but I want to at least show people that you don't have, it's not being weak to admit that there's something wrong. And I'm very confident in the, in who I am and, and the fact that, you know, I think I'm a badass, you know, to an extent. We do too. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No, I mean, I, I think we're all pretty much so badasses. So let here. me ask the, the obvious question then. You lose both your legs, you get a TBI. I mean, these are, more than traumatic. These are significant life-changing injuries, but you're out there, you're driving around, you're doing things, you're, you know, you get into the creative world. Is it maybe easier for you because you had such a, a big hit as opposed to the person's like, I came out fine. And then next thing you know, they can't deal with it. Oh, definitely. I think having a physical, the physical injuries, and we saw it all the time. I don't know if Jose can attest to this too, but it was a lot of the guys who came out with the non-visible injuries that seem to have the hardest time to recover. Because for us, like me, it was all about walking. Once yeah. I could walk, then I wanted to get out of the hospital. For these guys who, they can't physically see what's going on, or maybe they feel like they shouldn't be here and they are. That Survivor's Guild, I know, especially is, is a huge a huge player in, in veteran depression and suicide. Well, and I know, like for me, a lot of my struggle was in asking for that help you were talking about. Because I am fine. There is somebody more at, close at the end of their rope. But it turns out I was really close at the end of my rope. You know, I really needed yeah. help. Well, and the problem is that we all, we try to compare. Like, yeah. and I even do it in, I guess, a positive standpoint where it's like, well, my injuries aren't as bad as, say, somebody who's missing three limbs or someone who's a, a quadriplegic, right. you know. I still have a pretty functioning body as compared to what it could be. Yeah. But at the same time, that doesn't make the struggles that any of us are going through any less important than somebody who say isn't injured physically at all. The things that are going on in their head could be just as violent and vicious as mine or anybody else's. Yeah. Have you talked about that day when, when you got, when you got blown up, when that happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that you don't talk about, but I can feel it. You know, I, I've been able to craft a pretty good story of a comfortable amount of, Enough for a regular person to understand without going too over. Yeah, I don't ask that. I never ask that question because, I mean, me and Pete and, and all of us sitting here, we we know so many of the same people. And Josue's over here, and I thought it was fun. Let's just break off on that. It's like the best part was, hey, when's the last time you guys met? Tell everybody when the last time you met Josue <laughs> was. Well, not the... <laughs> Not the last time I met him. The first time the that first we, time. the first time that we met and talked face to face was 
when I hit his car <laughs> on my way on one of my classes to get out of out of the military. I was in a rush and just wasn't paying attention and ended up hitting the side of his car. But Josue was super cool about it for the fact that <laughs> that was 100% <laughs> my fault. And then, yeah, we I mean, we just kind of became friends after that. And, of course, you know, we run into each other all the time. And, yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's interesting. The circles and just, you know, despite going through all of the service and all of the, the, the trauma, the, the physical and the emotional trauma and processing that and being able to share that, I think I'm always amazed by that because I think we're really lucky to have this connection, not just what we have, but the ability to share it with so many other people and help those guys that are a little bit afraid to share their story because I really think that it's, so important and it's in stark contrast to a lot of the vietnam vets we talk about who have and i think it's through me their their form of media or society that they really suppressed all that stuff and said i didn't have this or i didn't do this and maybe it was our culture that didn't welcome them home the way our tribe is welcomed back into society i think people have gotten that to a a better degree but to share that's really important and now you you go through all this, all this fighting, these deployments, the separation. And now I look at you, you're married, you got a brand new baby and you really transitioned into a realm that a lot of people, especially a lot of veterans think I could never have done this. Take us and tell everybody what that one catalyst was where you said, I'm going to do this, whether it was, it was it the modeling first and then the acting and yeah. how'd that springboard you? Honestly, it sprung. It all started from very low point of my life. I had just gotten out of the hospital, and it was right around the one year anniversary of my incident. And for those who don't know, my buddy TJ was killed the same night that I was injured. He was actually killed because of the bomb that I stepped on. Uh, and so that survivor's guilt it really lingered, and that's what I'll tell anyone. It's the physical aspect was had its challenges but it was ultimately the mental aspect that was the hardest to get over are you over it i don't think you can ever truly be over it i i like to say that the mountain doesn't get easier you just get used to climbing it Hmm. and so yeah it was it was that very first year and i didn't know how to you know i was bad at climbing that mountain yeah and i was desperate looking for any way anything that could distract me to kind of remind me and at the same time remind me while I was still here and so I just I just kind of got into working out one day I was just laying around the house and uh just decided to go to the gym and that was probably the first like feeling of like an endorphin rush that I had in a while and so I kept going back kind of just for me uh and then somebody I caught wind from somebody in town who had said something about being inspired by seeing me at the gym. And that's when I kind of realized that I had a, a gift in a sense, you know, this thing that I could give other people. And so that's ultimately what sparked the modeling. Cause I heard through Facebook of this guy who was trying to take pictures of injured, injured veterans. And I was pretty proud of the shape that I had gotten in by that point. So started doing that, which kept going further and further and further and then um today i'm lucky enough to have a recurring role on general hospital and work with jockey and stuff like that how do they treat you how do you how do you fit into the whole jockey brand i mean it's a huge brand and and like i mean if there's someone listening like you that wants to do that like how do you get in the door i mean do you mentor guys that are wanting to do that do you get you know what's the best advice you give people that just say yeah it doesn't fall in their lap or someone doesn't discover them like you have to put yourself out there yeah how do they do that well i mean honestly the easiest way is just i mean most of what i found was through when i found jockey and all that stuff it was through social media i mean there's it's so easy now to stay if you truly want to there are groups and talent agencies out there that you can follow and they're constantly broadcasting stuff like that but you just have to go out there and kind of actively try to find what you want to do and This might go contrary to what most people I think in the industry will say, but, you know, don't just find anything and everything that you want to do, like find things that you're passionate about, because those are the things that you put the most effort into. 
because uh, when I found when I did the jockey thing, I actually was getting out of the modeling part because I had just gotten sick of it at that point. I was getting ready to go to school for business, and I had seen something about it, or someone had had asked me about it, and so I put it in there and I did my research, and they talked to me about it, and I was really passionate about what they were trying to do, which was you know, show an inspirational message. It wasn't one of these stupid commercials that you see nowadays. At least in my mind, I was, it was something that I could be passionate about. The companies too, when you're in that, when you're in the entertainment business, like it, it could be pretty cutthroat. And, it, and when you align with a company like Jockey, mm -hmm. you know, they, I assume they treat you well. Yeah. Jockey's a really good company. I've really enjoyed my time with them. Yeah. And especially if you're new to the industry, um, and even me, I mean, I'm not an, an expert or uh, or anything by any means, but I've been in it long enough now to know when people are truly interested in you or just what they can take from you. Yeah, you do the the modeling, it turns into acting on General Hospital. I, I mean, at what point do you stop now in, in life and think back when you're at Recruit Depot, would you go to San Diego? Yeah. Yeah, you're in San Diego, you're thinking like, I'm going to be, a, you know, double amputee posing in my underwear, flexing my abs and like having all these adoring fans. And were you married at the time? Not yet. I was one of those stupid <laughs> boots who uh, got married really young to get out of the barracks. So, but yeah, no, I definitely, if you would ask me this seven, seven to 10 years ago, you would ask me this five years ago and I would have laughed in your face because there was no <laughs> way that me of all people would be a guy who could never take a good picture to save his life would all of a sudden be doing any of this stuff and especially missing two legs life has its own direction how does that you. how does that make you feel do you do you stop now and, and take stock in that yes and no i will be honest and say that part of me i forgot what it was called i think it's called like imposter syndrome or something like that yeah i always get it worse around the anniversary because it's like sometimes i still don't feel like it's should be real yeah and so sometimes i do have to kind of force myself in and sit down and say you worked for this like you deserve what's happening because sometimes you know it's when things are going good too good to be true it's like i feel like i have a great life and then you know you feel like you shouldn't and then i have to kind of remind myself that it's all happening for a reason and it's not just hmm. because it all I fell into it. It's because I've tried to get to this point. Yeah, you're doing the work. And I think that that is something you should be proud of. That in and of itself makes you equally badass, in my opinion, because a lot of guys just see the obstacles in front of them and, and won't have the drive to move past that. And the fact that you're willing to continue to battle through and you take all those things. And, you know, I say this all the time is the Marine Corps was a big part of who I am, but it didn't encompass me as a whole person. But that drive and discipline of being a young Marine at such a young age, I think you just carry that with you in the military. And it's not just the Marine Corps. It's not exclusive. But those things are ingrained in your DNA to a degree. And I think that once you're reunited with those types of moments where you want to continue to drive on, there's something in you that just pushes forward. Mm -hmm. Whether you're pushing forward in boot camp or training or on the battlefield or an injury or a, a mental roadblock, and you continue to push through that, I think... That really is a testament to what our nation's military does. And, and I, never, I never discount that because I think it's really, I give a lot of credit to that for the success I have. And I'm, I ask that question, do you stop and take stock? Because I'm probably one of the worst people to stop and say, you did this or you've accomplished this, you've helped these people because I'm always wanting to do more. I always feel like I have to do more. And I'm lucky when there's people like you guys and, and my family surrounding me that say, dude, man, do you realize you did this? I mean, look what you've done. I mean, to inspire people at your gym or to just throw yourself out there on social media and, you know, hang it out there. And then to get on television on a, on a major daytime soap like General Hospital, I mean, that takes a lot of courage in and of itself. And there's so many different shapes and forms of courage. I think that's really a great example for people that think, man, I'm just not going to be able to do this. So, the acting, man, I gotta, I gotta ask because we know a lot of actors, but not a lot of veteran actors. We, we, we know several, but great guys have been on the show like Vinnie Vargas and Nate Boyer and a couple others. But did you learn how to act? Did someone t give you acting classes or say, man, you're a natural? Definitely wasn't a natural <laughs> because 
I think like a lot of us can attest to. You join in the military and you get real good at really displaying two emotions, either being angry or not caring. And so those are got those covered. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if it came down to that, I was fine. But <laughs> when it came to actually like trying to be authentic and, and have feelings and not only that, but in the, the acting business, you almost have to overreact to everything. Sure. It's got to be bigger on camera yeah, exactly. or on stage. Right? Mm -hmm. One of the things we've had a number of soap stars on. And one of the things they've said is that the pace of work, and we're talking big stars like Lorenzo Lamas, yeah. who's been in tons of things. He's like, I have huge respect for those guys because the short amount of time I did it, it was work, 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 work. You never got to stop. You got your sides. If you were going to go to the park, you carried your sides with you mm -hmm. and you worked on your lines because it was relentless. Yeah, well, you shoot a new episode, at least General Hospital, a lot of the soaps, God, I, yeah, I, it was, I was really kind of, I feel like I was kind of thrown in there because it was my first big thing. In soaps, we're filming a new episode every workday. Yeah. So it's like, you know, whereas a show or a movie, you can kind of spend all day on one scene. You got to have a whole episode done by the end of the day. And so you only get four, four takes tops to get it right. And if you don't get it right, they just have to make do with what they've got. And so that, if you screw up enough times, then they stop wanting you on. And that's how you end up falling down ele an elevator shaft or <laughs> disappearing off the face of the planet somehow. Or doing blue blocker ads. Yeah. On yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's fun, but it's not impossible for people to get into. Like I said, it just, you have to actively look. It, you know, some of, I will say some of it is luck because there are a lot of people who are approaching it. But especially if you're a veteran, you have that drive. Um, or at least you should, you have that drive and that discipline to, to keep going, even if you don't want to, even if you feel like it's not getting anywhere on the set of a, a big soap like that. Are there people that mentor you that you look up to that, that you give credit to, or are there other veterans on the set that you can kind of align with? Yeah. I, and I just realized, yeah, I totally like skipped over that part of your first question. I've been lucky enough to work with some coaches and there are people on the show who want to work with you. They want you to succeed. It's not all stepping on, you know, on each other to, to get to where they want to go. But there are a lot of people who, if you ask them just like, hey, you know, I'm having trouble kind of getting this part of, you know, the scene across, what can I do? They'll usually sit down with you and work with you until it gets better. So I'd have to say overall, that's probably the, the best instruction. Veteran actors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, veteran actors. Yeah, there's not a lot of them, as you were saying before. There's. Are you the first combat vet, double amputee, that's been on that show? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There's not a lot of combat veterans. There's not a lot of amputees or really anybody disabled who's acting. Which I could, that could be a whole nother topic and tangent on my part. But yeah, I've been the first amputee combat vet. Uh, on most of the projects. How was it How was it when you were thrust into the set? I can imagine that day because in some of the social things we sit in and, you know, host Wake and, and kind of attest to this too, is, you know, we, we work out at the same gym here in, in Temecula at Fitness 19. And I'm surrounded by guys who, you know, through their service have lost limbs and eyes and all the guys. How many guys without eyeballs do we know in the show? It's <laughs> so ridiculous, many. man. And people are like, how do you know all these guys? Like, I don't know. They're just guys we hang out with. But I can see... Some civilians, you know, they orbit around and they, they, you know, they don't know how to approach or they don't know what to say. They don't want to see something awkward. And we're, I just see Marines like, you yeah. know, and, but on the set in Hollywood and that whole scene, how was that? Did you have that feeling where the eyes were all on you? Not only as a, as an amputee, as a, as a vet, as a combat vet and as a rookie actor, how, I mean, how did you feel? Yeah. You know, you get nervous. You know, especially when it's your first time on anything, uh, on anything that's big, you know, big picture. Yeah. And to be on a major network show, I still didn't believe that it was happening. And then you walk into a room with these people that have been doing it for years, veteran actors who know what the hell they're doing. And yeah, it can be kind of uh, scary, I guess, for the lack of a better term. And I kind of remind myself, again, it goes to, with the confidence thing, like, I'm still probably one of the most badass people here. You know what I mean? There's nobody here who's done what I've done unless, like you know, I'm hanging out with Remy and then that doesn't work. I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe there's one more person who's more badass around here than I am. And you're number two. Yeah, exactly. But even then, it's, it's like... equal shades of badass. It, yeah, and that's what absolutely. it is. It's like, there's no one who 
it, it just kind of helps me remember that there's nobody here who is better than I am just because they've been in this industry longer. That's purely because they took that opportunity at a sooner time than I did. You know, a lot of people who were developed in the industry who are my age were doing so through high school, middle school, high school. They were taking classes while I was in boot camp, you know? So I'm starting way later than a lot of these people and I'm still, you know, in a similar area to them. So I, I just see it as we're all equals. It's a vastly different schoolhouse of confidence training, whether yeah. it's acting school, Marine Corps boot camp, but still applicable I, to any industry that you want to get into. And I think that's cool because when you're up in Hollywood and you're, you're around quote unquote celebrities and people that have relative fame or whatever, I've always been the same way where, you know, I think they should want my autograph just as much as anyone would want theirs because of what we've, what we've done and sacrificed and, you know, in, in perspective. And I will say this, I'm not bad. I'm not bagging on actors because it's a tough job. It like people don't understand. It's like, you put a lot of hours in, it's a grind. It's not a lot of money unless you're like a mega, mega star. Uh, so you're busting your ass. So I have a lot of respect and we know so many people that really give of themselves and time yeah. to support veterans who have a lot of relative fame. Like, like Jay Moore, we were just talking about him and everything he's doing for veterans and, and, and my foundation, SaveTheBrave.org, you know, there's people out there that love veterans and sometimes they just don't know how to ask or the right questions. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You know, there's people out there that love veterans, and sometimes they just don't know how to ask or the right questions in that industry. So to do what you're doing, I think is, uh, it fascinates me, man. And it makes me proud that, you know, not only we're to see other Marines doing kick-ass stuff in the industry, but to really be a voice and and help other veterans. And and it just makes me proud, man. And, and, you know, we're, we're neighbors too. We're all neighbors here. So yeah, Yeah. it's pretty cool. We, you know, the, the circles overlap quickly. There's about one degree of separation between us all. Some is guys run into other's cars and then they meet and then we wind <laughs> yeah. up in the same gym and then we work out and then. Okay. So we got an Intel report. We're going to go on patrol doing the pre-patrol brief and they're like, Hey, everybody really, especially be, you know, especially be hyper vigilant today and, and watch for signs of life and all the things that, you know, all what we're trying to do because we think there could be action this day. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's not necessarily scary, but it's intense when, you know, going out, like they're listening, they're watching, they're waiting. And then the director says, you're next, get ready to go. And you're going to go get in front of that big hot light and stand in front of Susan Lucci or whoever it is. Which to you is more intense? That's a good question, actually. I would have to say they're both equally intense, but just for very different reasons. Because obviously the adrenaline, the stress and the adrenaline of knowing that at any second, you know, you're in this country that a lot of people want you dead. Yeah. And they'll do what they can to kill you that itself its own level of you know something but you're there you're in this you're you're, you've been doing this job you know you've been training to do this job in afghanistan but you know deep down that no matter how much training you have it could all go sideways it's like whereas in the civilian world it's like seeing all those people or like getting up on a stage or getting in front of a bunch of cameras with people staring at you it's like okay don't screw up but then you realize probably not going to die if I screw this up. You know what I mean? So perspective. Yeah. They're both very intense, but in very different ways. Yeah. That's a good question. What's more intimidating fucking up in front of your squad leader and platoon sergeant or an audience of how many million viewers? On General yeah. Hospital? yeah. Yeah. Especially when things are, are live. Like I try not to think about that. Like uh, I got the opportunity to present at the uh, daytime Emmys with Harley, which was real cool. Um, uh, of course they wanted Harley there. I just so happened to be her owner. So that's why they asked me to go to nice. tell everybody who Harley is. <laughs> Harley is my, uh, she's my yellow lab and she was my dog, my bomb dog in Afghanistan. Yeah. So you yeah, got so to bring her home. I got to keep her. Yeah. I got to bring her home and keep her. So glad they got that stuff sorted out. You got another know. dog too. I've got two other dogs. Two. <laughs> yeah. A little Strashire terrier mix and, uh, a little Chihuahua who's missing a back leg. Yeah. What, what's yeah. her name? Yeah, uh, his name's Bones. Bones and, then that's Bones right. and Vader. Yeah. 
We met Bones at what was the off road place we were all at hanging out? Oh, Warfighter Man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warfighter Man. Let's give those guys a shout out because they yeah. brought us together. You were there that day, Warfighter Main. So we were hanging out there. We mm-hmm. were actually all there to get together, just sh- showed up. And Nick Velez was there, Bastards Canteen. He catered it for that yep. great event. So, yeah, again, here in our hometown, Temecula, man, they, they're always. It's a great town for vets. Yeah. No, we're all really close knit. I mean, yeah. I have another compare and contrast question okay. for you. Right. I so like these. I'm assuming I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm assuming you've not been hollered at while you're on the set of General Hospital for screwing something up, as opposed to having like Gunny stand in front of you. Gunny, who makes 1800 bucks a month, just screaming at you, and you're like, ah, you're terrified, right? So I'm assuming that, that you haven't been yelled at professionally in the acting world. But if you look at like a brigade commander, 5,000 or so people underneath them, untouchable to someone who's at the company level like you're just not ever going to talk to that person unless they talk to you and then you're supposed to say very specific things mm-hmm. you know how do you like chow i'm told i like it just fine you know that kind <laughs> yeah. of and then there's the executive <laughs> producer of the show same kind of thing where like you may interact with them but really you know not, not a whole lot directly how do you compare those i mean two enormously important people you know general hospital is their show it's their money on the line their backers money on the line and a lot of pressure the big difference I'd have to say between the two, well, one, you know, most of the people that I've dealt with in the military that were untouchable, that was before I lost my legs. And there is a huge difference between the way I'm acting. Because when I got first got injured, and I'm sure Hoseway can attest to this too, is, you know, you get generals yeah. who come up to you and insist that you call them by their first name. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, you get promoted. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like I had uh, the general that helped me get Harley back home he would call me every week asking how I was doing. And actually that's what started. That's what uh, provoked Harley. Everyone to start working to get Harley back to me was because I had just like in passing, he just called me up one week, asked how I was doing. And in passing, I was like, yeah, I'm just waiting to hear back from this guy about Harley. And then like 45 minutes later, my dad's calling me like next time you ask a general for help, better let me know. Cause now we have 300 <laughs> people in this office trying to find out where exactly. she is. Who is right. the general? General Levy. He was a one star who worked with, forgot who the other general was, but they basically ran all the planes in the Air Force. What's his first name? General. <laughs> general. Yeah, General. He said he was calling him by his first Sir. name. I, I still can't get used to that. Like, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's weird. Well, I mean, you got a lot higher up in the military chain yeah, than but I did. Still, too. you know, like, yeah, I retired as a major, but still, it's a general level officer, you know, flag officer is still weird. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, but, Yeah, the big difference I'd have to say is uh, with the executive producers, they're usually pretty blunt, but you know, much like, you know, somebody high up in the chain of command would be, but you know, they're not going to have you digging fighting holes and stuff like that. The worst case scenario is that you piss them off and you're not on the show, which is a bummer. So you do watch your mouth, but again, it just goes to that. Like, this isn't the worst situation I've been in. Yes. It could easily be way more dramatic, and it's usually not. Normally, people kind of, at least in the civilian part, if you're messing up, they'll let you know, but it's not the worst. I mean, it's a business, right? They don't get yeah. time for a whole bunch of carrying. I mean, especially in the soap opera. You know, it's yeah, they don't yeah, get exactly. time for all this extra stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess it would be no different than pissing your boss off in, in the normal world if you mess up enough times, you're going to be fired. Yeah. I like the prep for combat that Chris talks about too, before he goes on, on camera and you can, the, the nervousness before you hit the set or get in front of the camera and you go live or do a show. I always remember I, you know, 24 years in the Marine Corps, every time I did a PFT that night before you're like, ah, fuck. And I can't, you're nervous. Like yeah. you, there's butterflies. You're like, ah, I've done this a hundred times, man. Yes. But like, I'm fear. I fear the PFT, and I always crushed it. But that's a physical fitness. Yeah. Test. So, and then you move into this totally different realm, and you do that prep for combat mentally. And uh, you know, you are literally talking to millions of people tuning into this show or getting up there. And I love what you said too, is because I say this, it, you know, whenever I have to do something, and that those nerves still kick in, and I go stand. And I'm speaking to five, six thousand people, and I'm nervous. But right at that moment before I get up there, and it resonated when you said that, I kind of say to myself, hey, they asked me to be here. They want me to be here. And I wouldn't be here if they didn't want me. So I'm going to, I prepare, I know I've prepared, I know I've rehearsed, I've, I've 
I, you know, remember my speech and, and, and I'm ready for this. And I step up and then boom, you deliver. And I think that that's, I mean, that's cool. People should understand is like, you know, yeah, you're there for a reason, but the reason you got there too, Chris, is because you put the work in and your reputation and everything you've done has gotten you to that point where you're doing so many great things. So let's, let's talk, let's shift gears. Let's talk about what you got coming up. Like what, what is it that you've done now? Like as if being a Marine isn't enough, you know, right. going to combat and surviving everything isn't enough. Being a model, national, maybe you could be model. a pants model and put some fucking pants on for a change. <laughs> yeah, you know, probably <laughs> not. <laughs> Adam, what? Probably not. I'm really trying to get uh, Converse, model. Converse to to sign me up because I basically wear their shoes all the time. So you're repping Converse, like, hey, Converse, check me. Yeah, out. I should be like, hey, I yeah. wear your shoes, but if you could pay me money to do it, that'd be cool. We'll tag Converse in this. Yeah, absolutely, episode for sure. But what's next? So we have a couple things, nothing I'm going to talk about in detail too much right now. But yeah, just I'm hoping to get more on General Hospital. Hopefully, you know, every year something new and exciting happens. So starting next year, we're really going to try to push uh, more into the acting gigs, now, especially now that Milo's older. Um, But yeah, I got some writing things that I'm doing. got a couple business ideas that I'm cooking up. Uh, so hopefully within the next year or two, those will start coming to fruition. What what t- where do you see yourself uh, like full length feature? Uh, you know, and, and I mean, what are you writing? Screenplays, books, books? Again, nothing super solid at the moment, just because life has been hectic. But yeah, it's just I kind of don't I'm trying not to nail myself down at one thing right now because I want to make sure that when the opportunity arises for for something cool i'm i'm there that makes sense yeah yeah you don't want to i i feel like that too and pete and i talk about this sometimes mm-hmm. because of our our makeup you know we want to always help and and connect people i find myself feeling like i'm an inch deep and a mile wide yep. where i need to be a mile deep and an inch wide and focus on those things that you talked about yeah no yeah it's it is and that, that's what i'm struggling with i'm right there with you is you know you we want to do all these things like I'm trying, you know, I want to be a better actor. I want to get these these business things off the ground. I want to be a good dad, you know, want to be there for my kid and stuff like that. But it's hard to do all those things because they all require different parts of you and you can't you can't be in different places at one time. Yeah. So. And, and in addition, you, we were just talking about this before the show. You're helping out with some nonprofits. Tell everybody, yeah. about, tell everybody about the nonprofits you're, you're supporting right now. So, well, yeah, we just did this thing with my buddy, one of the guys who helped me get harley back as well he started an organization called dogs to dog tags taking shelter dogs and trading them for veterans who who need them uh, whether it's as a service dog or just an emotional support dog but yeah we were just in ohio at the indy 200 partnering up with the harding Strandbenner uh, race team and you know they asked me to go out there because what happened with me and harley was this the jumping point of this organization so i just kind of went out there to be a spokesperson and stuff but just being able to help out for stuff like that it's fun but yeah it definitely takes a lot of your time if people want to find out about dogs dog tags where, where do they go to just go to i mean you can find them on social media facebook instagram dogs to dog tags or you can go to their website dogs to dog tags dot org we were talking about too is it's there's so many nonprofits in the veteran space you know being able to help one and align with one and you believe in the mission it's uh i mean there's just so much out there i can't especially the dog thing and you're you're tied to harley and all things dogs and a good friend of ours right across the street i, th- I think you know tom tackett too patriotic service dog foundation i think so yeah yeah tom's a dear friend of mine he's doing good stuff we partner with save the brave and we we, we share events you know we host an event and then we say Hey, we're not going to just hold on to all the money because we're not in competition. We want to help like-minded people that are are willing to help vets. And you know, we we did an event at Las Flores Car Wash and raised over ten grand. And we're like, yeah, we'll split it down the middle with you, man, and help each other out. But Tom's an amazing dude. He's helping you know so many people. With he's training, yeah, training the dogs. And these aren't shelter dogs; they're purebred service dogs that he certifies. And just yeah, he's doing amazing things, man. So. Not a whole lot of veteran actors yet. We probably know 20 if you started thinking about it. I want to do like a Guns of Navarone or Dirty Dozen modern take. 
with only veteran Hollywood type folks. So Mark Valley is, you know, the general. Because he's older than all of us. Right. Michael Broderick. Michael Broderick is, uh, you know, he's a seasoned <laughs> actor. He comes in. You're there. Yeah, it's all Vinny about Vargas. it's all about just talking to the right people. Yeah, and we yeah. make something happen. That'd it, be awesome. it really, it really, yeah, that'd be cool. Everybody can wear yeah. turtlenecks. <laughs> I hate turtlenecks. <laughs> Whatever. You don't have to wear That's one. The one thing I hate, I never love that woolly pulley sweater either. I have tactile issues. Uh-huh. So like if it's too, oh man, I always wore tight. like the little neck gaiters and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. So That's because like... I got a long, lengthy neck. What's the one? Yeah, I, we don't even talk about my favorite military issued item. Yeah. It's got to be the poncho liner. Oh, yeah, the that, Wooby? That's, that's my what, favorite. That's you what, actually got issued that's what they a Wooby, call it now, Wooby. Yeah. Did you get issued one, or did you have to buy one? I get issued one. Who okay. doesn't get issued one? I mean, I, a yeah. lot of times I don't get issued one. You know, they make hoodies out of that stuff now. My brother wore it. No. He stopped by, and he was wearing it because he went up to Breck uh, last month. Who's and that? Who makes that? Some lady over there by Pendleton. I don't know. Oh, I got like, to find her because I've been telling Pete since I've we should have like a Saturday Night Live five, you know, five time jacket member club, and like I want to, I want our jackets to say the Break of Dawn show, but they should be made out of poncho liner material. Oh, yeah. The like field the jacket liner was was the Wooby in field jacket form. Yeah, and they've made offshoots of that that are more fitted and tailored. I would wear that. Chris under would my need something overbox. super sexy. Yeah, uh, Rudy Reyes would need a sleeveless model mm-hmm. for him and tiny cami pants. And t- tiny <laughs> spandex. We could get Jeff Gum, Sung of Life. I mean, all these uh-huh. people, man, it just keeps bleeding over into yeah. all these cool dudes that are just doing kick ass shit in entertainment. And- uh, on your on your kit to go out, what was something that you wanted to have that like only made sense to you? Like I get asked a lot of times, like, what's the best knife to carry? And I'm like, the smallest, lightest knife that does the most things. Not a K bar, you know, like oh yeah, you know, <laughs> like a strap cutter if you ride an M M wraps a lot, so you can get the hell out of that thing. That's about all I ever needed. But what did, what was your thing? Well, we were always dismounted. We hardly ever rode in any sort of VIX um, while we were there, at least. Yeah, we were like one of the only, which I was always super butthurt about because everybody would go drive off and there we would be just walking around. But I was always very adamant in making sure that you just had enough medical supplies. I don't know why. I was always like, I was always very adamant in making sure that anything I could possibly need was right there. Because I know you had the Corman and stuff, but... God forbid something happens to him. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the Corman's this 18-year-old kid who went through yeah. field med school who like it's like you don't know especially... doesn't know what he doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially, I mean, you know, this was all all of our first deployment to Afghanistan, his included. And I mean, when we when I got injured, I mean, he got a bronze star for that night because five guys, five, you know, one K, two critically yeah. injured, three critically injured. And he just he performed absolutely stellar just i don't think anyone could have done as good of a job as he did that night you remember his name yeah what's his name jack crowley jack crowley yeah so if he's listening brother and i'll i'm gonna let him know i'm gonna have him tune in but jack man semper fi brother yeah and did he need extra medical supplies that night because i bet he did well he did so what happened was so my buddy brad was the one who stepped on the first ied and then as we were trying to get him out is when i stepped on the second one well Crowley was working on Brad when I stepped on mine. So luckily his like, and keep in mind, both these IEDs were maybe four feet apart, three, four yeah. feet apart. Luckily he was in the, in the hole working on Brad's legs when I stepped on mine. So the only thing that on him that got messed up was that his whole, the whole back of his, his plate carrier had gotten blown off. What that meant though, was that the med pack that he had on the bottom of it got blasted off too. So sure. When we all got messed up, there wasn't anything to, to dull the pain, but he still, luckily, adrenaline is a great thing in those situations, and um, I didn't really start feeling it until probably about 10, 15 minutes into it, but, I mean, he still, even getting concussed like that, he still was on top of it. Yeah, it's incredible what you actually need on a patrol, right? Like. In the movies, apparently you have unlimited ammo, but ammo is oh, fucking yeah. heavy. Yeah. You know, like you get into a firefight for more than, let's say, I mean, a real firefight for more than about 20 minutes. Dismounted, you're running out of ammo. Like, there's just only so much shooting you can do. Yeah. You're at least worried about like, hey, we got to really be careful how much more we shoot, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. And I will say right towards the, right around when I got injured, because it was starting to get summertime. And so they get, you know, a lot more active. Yeah. There's like the week before I got injured, we were out doing a security thing 
and we, we didn't realize we were going to be out there for 18 hours we had run out of water yeah easy and then right towards the end of it we started getting into some pretty heavy stuff and by the time that we had gotten back to the fob we were just like running on fumes both in terms of ammo and gear sure. and water and stuff like that it's yeah. like just a day you don't realize how much stuff you use and it's really easy especially like if you're doing suppressive fire yeah to have 210 rounds of common load you'll see someone carry that could be gone in seconds yeah oh yeah you know if you're not mindful and it's easy to like lose track of that and like oh shit yeah I'm especially gone. caught up in the moment oh man yeah yeah absolutely having trucks is a curse and a blessing yeah. at times but being foot mobile also has its benefits but you're super exposed and i mean my favorite story that that i told and i think i wrote about it was my guys were out patrolling the, the streets you know there's all the you know just like the shit you guys were stepping on that were that was fucking our guys up they would clutter the sides of the road so i requested an armored tram to come and like literally grade the side of the road and plow all of the shit they would pile up there and the logistics guy you know he's back in the rear with the gear he says oh well we we can't send it we don't have any armored trams out there we just have trams i said so send a tram with a driver in armor i said my guys are walking around with no trams surrounding them sure, in armor sure. and you got to send this thing and they denied the request they denied the request and then finally my good friend uh paul nugent who was the opso for the mew pushed it through and we had tram show up and you know those kids are sitting there back in the on the fob with their tram. They're just they can't wait to get out there with the grunts and and support us. That's all they want to do is just get in get in the mix. And they came out and you know did a little did a little inner city cleanup. And uh, I don't know how much it helped. I mean, it was a theory, but it we we were able to stay away from big piles of shit that would blow us up. So that helped. Yeah, but. nothing else, just peace of mind. Absolutely. Yeah, you knew after those guys went through and cleared that out like a a fresh snowfall which Iraq uh, was like it had been snowing shit and garbage for years. If they cleared that away and something new popped up, then we were like, oh, that was not there because yeah. we just plowed this road. So that was, yeah, it was pretty helpful. We had training one time, free deployment to Afghanistan, and they told us that every culvert, everywhere where a bomb could be put under the road at all, you had to stop and wait for EOD to come clear it. Oh, really? Yeah. That is not reality. No, like no. That's, you wouldn't move an inch if that was the case. Yeah, you would. You would just be in mission. In, but that was the that was the pre deployment training was to wait for EOD to come and clear something. Like first off, there's not even anything there, you know. And 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 you guys know like what really happens is is if you're worried about it, you send two guys up. They go and they look. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that you think is something, you put some C4 on it. Kaboom. See you later. Mission. You know, continue mission. But again, now you got a guy carrying C4 or blasting caps and. Yeah, you know that that's not light. It's really easy to run out of capacity to carry things, especially water. Gosh, you're surrounded by that risk. And we we started the show off talking about the risk you take when you join the Marine Corps and you get thrust into combat. And I mean, Chris, you've taken a lot of risks after the Marine Corps in acting. I guess I, I the last question I have is, what's the one biggest risk that you think you're going to take next? The biggest risk that I think I'm going to take next, probably something business related. Because, again, I, I don't want to say anything too soon, but I'm really hoping what we have planned here in the next couple of years really blossoms into something great. But it's going to take a lot of work and, quite frankly, a lot of luck. I hope that I, in a, when we do this in like two years from now and we're talking about this, I hope that I can really kind of go out and talk about it. But I hope everyone can just be patient because. Yeah. Well, you know, you've got some all cool. of our support behind yeah, you, man. Yeah, those yeah. guys. People want to find you on social media. You're all over the place. Where, tell everybody where they can find Chris Van Eden. So the biggest place that I really promote myself is Instagram, Chris Van Eden official. Or if you just type Chris Van Eden, you should see me. I do have a Twitter and a Facebook. Do update Twitter every now and again. Facebook, not so much. But if you want to follow me, that's where I'm at. Chris Van Eden official on Instagram. You can follow him there. And I just want to say thanks again. And uh, again, to all the listeners, Pete Turner for having me co-host the show again and being a proud sponsor of Save the Brave. If you want to find out more about Save the Brave, go to savethebrave.org. You can click donate, monthly recurring donation. You can reach us at info at savethebrave.org if you want to volunteer in the local area. We're doing great things. We help hundreds of veterans. We're a 100% nonprofit. 
And I just want to say thanks again, brother, for, for being on this episode. And uh, can't wait to have you back on to hear about yeah. all the great stuff. I appreciate it, man. Thanks. Yeah.